Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 878. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is September 10th, 2024. All right, welcome to another wonderful episode of Anglican Unscripted. This is where Kevin and George sit down in front of our webcams and talk about the news. Most of it Anglican, th- thank goodness. Some of it Christian, and, uh, and yeah, November's coming. We're going to spice in some politics here and there. Uh, we have a debate coming up tonight that, oh boy, my, <laughs> whatever. So, George, how are you doing this week? Very good. I went to the Mayo Clinic yesterday up in Jacksonville, and they reflashed my uh, pacemaker. Control, Evidently, alt, the, delete? Was it? No, they upgraded the operating system. No. Uh, <laughs> Evidently, when they put the pacemaker in, they less left the in out of the box settings on. And which was so it was set for a 79 year old seven sedentary man. So uh, the specialist and the Mayo Clinic is the best in Florida for heart work. Mm-hmm. And I had somebody who specializes in heart rhythm and all this stuff. He basically said, well, you didn't need a pacemaker in the first place. You don't need further surgery. Here's how we can take care of you. And let me just reflash your pacemaker to make you feel better. So I, you know, sometimes you need to go and see the specialist sure. and pay the extra bucks to get the yeah. good treatment. A little more blood flow around the body helps a lot, especially if you want to do some exercise. There's nothing worse than walking down the street and the heart's only doing 65 beats per minute. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm glad you got that worked out. Uh, we are here in Maryland for a little while longer, and uh, this weekend we're heading out to Hershey, Pennsylvania for the, it's it's termed and named the largest RV show. It's not really the largest. It's like the second largest. And we'll go out there and we will uh, find things that we can't afford and we'll we'll get to tour them, and just that's just part of the RV life is to uh, be consumerist, even though we can't afford it. So, so, so this is sort of like the uh, the RV equivalent of the Oshkosh Air Show. Yeah, if where... you're a flight person, you go to Oshkosh. If you are a car person, you go to uh, Michigan. Here, you go to uh, either Tampa has the largest one or Hershey, and we're not going to make it to the Tampa one this year. So. Uh, we went there two years ago. It was a blast. Uh, you know, there's a, at least uh, 15,000 people with their RVs there, all parked around the little Coliseum. And you go in, and uh, they have probably about 800 different models to go and look at, and then all the different uh, third party products you can buy f- for your RV, uh, which I own already. So, yeah, I'm going there just to hang out with other RVers, George. That's what I'm going there for. So. That's Such is life. Okay, we got to. Oh, before we get too far, please like this episode. If you see it on YouTube and you're watching it on YouTube, obviously, or Facebook, click that like button. It looks just like my thumb right here. Uh, if you've not subscribed yet, click that red rectangle. Click the subscribe button. It will change your color and it pops up a little bell. That bell is what you click to get instant notifications. Yes, I know it doesn't work all the time for everyone, but most of you get an instant notification. So that's good. If you've not ever gone to the comment section that's where it's happening that's where people hang out and you need to go there and add your voice to the 400 comments we had a couple weeks ago it's nice to see you guys uh, really active in the show and uh that's kind of where we get to find out what you think not just what kevin and george think anything oh share it this episode is growing leaps and bounds not because of kevin and george and our wonderful content because you share this with people and i've seen the sharing go up a lot the last three weeks so we really appreciate that keep sharing um you're doing your, your due diligence sharing anglican unscripted is like giving us a donation because we're growing the, we're growing, growing the viewership and we appreciate that george you sent me a big story list this week i'll go up here to number one story breaking in our world, we heard about this this morning. Calvin Robinson is taking a job. He has been named the rector of St. Paul's Anglican Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. 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 Well, that's not that's that's not London. So well, good news, I guess, George. Well, good news for Calvin. He had expressed a desire to leave the UK over uh, fears of uh, free speech and persecution. Mm-hmm. He certainly would be on the radar with, uh, he's a former commentator on GB News, and he's quite prolific on Facebook, Internet, uh, Twitter, and whatnot. Twitter, yeah. 
sort of person that the government would want to crack down on. Well, he has taken a parochial post at a parish of the Anglican Catholic Church. Now, that's one of the continuing churches that were formed in 1977 following the Congress of St. Louis. Now, the Anglican Catholic Church uh, doesn't have any women clergy. It's, uh, fair, it's uh, on the spiky Anglo-Catholic side of the equation. So I think in churchmanship, Calvin would fit in just fine. Yes. Um, the uh, Anglican Catholic Church has about 35,000 members in the U.S. and India, South Africa, are its big places, and it's in other places as well. Um, and this is a parish that is big enough to afford, hi- afford a full-time rector. And Calvin is going to have a bit of a Father Ted situation in that they'll have a rector emeritus. The former rector's retired, lives locally, plus they have a deacon. So he'll have two people to help him Good. And sort of give him a sense of, see, parish ministry is different from the priesthood. I have to put it that way. That's you, can be a priest, it, yeah. Yeah. you can be a priest and have no clue or no skills whatsoever in parish ministry. Um, now, most priests work in parish, you know, the vast majority. But this is, a, this is a skill that you have to learn because a parish priest really is an engineer of human souls, that you basically have these systems, which is your church doctrine and discipline, that you use to work with people who are seeking fullness of Christ. And you have taught these tools and these mechanisms to bring them into deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. That's not something that's immediately obvious, and you certainly don't learn how to do it in seminary, at least I didn't. You learned it on the job. And fortunately, I, for my people here, I made all my mistakes 35 years ago and uh, said all the stupid things then. Well, I still say stupid things, but I'm not yeah, as offensively yeah. stupid uh, as I am now. No, parish so ministry is that. definitely something you grow into. Uh, I know so many people right out of uh, seminary. I got it. I know what to say. I know what to do. And you know, th- and they come away from their, their first uh, uh, parish meeting completely delusioned. Well, oh my gosh, I get hired by the church. Only four of the people on the vestry are actually Christian. Uh, the, the, they kind of didn't tell me what the budget really was. We've been losing members for six years, you know, that type of thing. And you, all of a sudden, you wake up to the, the real world that's beyond uh, the ideal world, you, you, world that you learned about in seminary. So, And, all, and also, uh, I mean, I've served in uh, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, and Florida in parishes in the United States. And the cultures of each region are very different. I had a, where I was trained was a church in uh, Trumbull, Connecticut that had both what I would call swamp Yankees, these uh, people who would say like three words all day and, uh, you know, very slow to speak, but very helpful in the life of the church and people who would commute into New York City. Um, That's very different uh, from uh, South Philadelphia and it's very different from rural Florida, so that even in the United States, the different cultures. It's so much easier being a priest in this part of Florida than it is in New England, which is very stony ground. Yeah. I've never served in the Midwest, but uh, I uh, so I hope Calvin is able to adapt to that local culture there. Yeah. Whether that means being a Detroit Lions or Chicago Bears fan, I don't know. Where <laughs> where. Where the line is in Michigan is between Bears and uh, uh, Lions fans. Well, Grand Rapids is still suffering from uh, the dissolution of the car industry there. It's still a major part of the Rust Belt. A um, lot of poverty. I hope that Calvin's you know, able to draw children and kids and uh, teens into the church because that's what's really missing in uh, the Grand Rapids area is the, the spark in the youth. And, uh, yeah, the, yeah, the Episcopal Diocese of Western Michigan... Um, just merged with the Diocese of Eastern Michigan. It's on decline, mm-hmm. and it's on decline for all the obvious reasons. As you mentioned, it's Rust Belt, but it's also drank the Kool-Aid and you know, thought that uh, by being uh, the church of what's happening now, it would attract young people. Well, it had repelled people, and so now that diocese had to merge with its neighboring diocese. That's the diocese, and it, that new diocese is called the Great Lake, Diocese of the Great Lakes which is the same name of the Acne Diocese <laughs> of the Great Lakes. Um, and that diocese is, I don't want to say it's having trouble, but it has a very high proportion of non-stipendary and part-time clergy, 
not because because they're basically starting off and in these little rust belt towns they don't have the inherited wealth that the episcopal church has to keep the building and the priest on set salary and staff mm-hmm. while uh while they spend the inheritance over the century so that this parish is able to pay calvin a wage is a wonderful thing uh, he's mm-hmm. got a salary so that he can then spend his nights or his free time doing his uh social media stuff in his comments. I do need to warn Calvin, the governor of Michigan is not a free speech governor. So, uh, <laughs> no, but it, he's got a perfect person to attack. And, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, uh, per, yeah, absolutely. Perfect common enemy. Let's move on to the UK church in Wales in decline. No surprise there. Uh, they're trying to mimic the Episcopal church in so many ways. Uh, They just had their governing uh, body meeting last week, but for some reason, they did not release the numbers. The numbers, oh, go on. Forgot, we didn't print them on the printer. We'll get them to you later, sort of thing. What's going on, George? Yeah, they did not release their parochial statistics. They said, you know, we'll give it to those who need it, which is a clear sign that they are in free fall. Uh, General body, I'm sorry, the governing body is their name for their synod or general convention, where the bishops, clergy, and lay delegates, deputies meet and go over the work of the church. And it was telling that the parochial statistics were not released. And what is even more telling from my perspective is that the speech, the sermon given at the opening of synod by the primate or archbishop of Wales, Andy John, was about the church's responsibility to the rivers of Wales. The rivers of Wales. Yes. Our respons- so our responsibility to the environment, in particular, the rivers of Wales. What the church, of, what church in Wales did was double down on the woke business. Um, environmentalism. Uh, uh, they are going to adopt gay marriage in the future. They're working on it. They're pushing social justice. And there was a long discussion where it was made quite clear that the prayers for conversion of gay people are right out. They're fully in, in, in line with the secular government's view on conversion therapy and the gay activists, that this is a terrible, evil thing if you pray for somebody. It's worse than owning a diesel car to pray for somebody. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, 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 the church is in free fall. It's been in a long time, free fall, mm-hmm. basically a hundred 200 years free fall, but they've been replacing the parish system with area ministry. Now, what that means is that you've got a salaried priest responsible for up to two dozen parishes with maybe an assistant who gets paid and maybe two or three non-stipendary people, uh, night school priests or deacons, covering, you know, these churches over an area where there might be 10 people here, eight people there, hundred years ago, 200 years ago, there were a hundred people here, 200 people there who could afford their own priest. And this parish system is basically getting a guy, putting in a guy in a car and driving around as fast as he can across the countryside. The attendance of the church in Wales is estimated to be below 10,000. And its membership is about the same as Calvin Robinson's new outfit. And here's one of the great things, you know, that we pay all this great homage. Oh, you're a member of the Anglican Communion because the Archbishop of Canterbury is in fellowship with you. And and the Church in Wales is equal in prominence to the Archbishop of Nigeria, the Bishop of, you know, the Church of Nigeria. It's a bit hypocritical when continuing churches, let alone the ACNA, which is 10 to 15 times the size of the Church in Wales, yeah. are treated as pariahs or stepchildren. Well, the church in Wales is you know, overrepresented in every aspect of Anglican communion life that you can think of. Well, if you look at the Church of Wales in the history, they are an example of religious nihilism. You know, they, they've come up with a way to um, make what's not important to the kingdom important to the church. Mm-hmm. And in doing so, they've lifted up Mother Nature and they put down those who need to live transforming lives, all of us. And I, those who seek transformation are taught that they don't need to transform, but we do need to transform how we treat 
by the earth. That's it. I do I do want to say that I'm not speaking about the rank and file clergy or the people in the Church of Wales, Church in Wales. Mm -hmm. It's their leadership, their bishops, their cathedral deans, their archdeacons. They've got a particularly bad crop of leaders. There's one good bishop, a new fella, but for the rest, they're uh, PC appointments, woke appointments, uh, identity politics appointments, a gay woman, uh, you know, all, all this and that. And they have not been able to bring the fire or passion of life in Jesus Christ alive. And there are some faithful clergy who are working with a bad bishop, a difficult secular environment, yet they're still able to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to people. Wales is tough ground. It's, it's, it's even tougher than New England is in the United States. But there are some people who are doing great work, both in the Church in Wales and in the AMIE, uh, or no, I'm sorry, Anglican Convocation of Churches in Europe. Yeah, yeah. They're not in England, they're in Wales. <laughs> but they, but what, I guess what I'm going to say is that I, when I talk about the Church in Wales, I'm talking about the institution. I'm not talking about the Christians of Wales. Yeah. And we have a God couple can dozen. do remarkable things with, with just one or two people. We have a couple dozen priests that watch the program who are from Wales or working in Wales. So, yeah, I mean, clearly um, there is, there is like we have here in America, bad leadership. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll give you an example of bad leadership. Just move it down one rank. You know, the bishop, the, the archbishop, I'll be unkind, and I'm, I'll, I call him a fool. He's a foolish fellow. Which one? Well, it's just the arch, Andy John. He's, okay. he's foolish. Yeah. Uh, he's the only divorced and remarried archbishop. Uh, out there in the Anglican communion, that I, of which I'm aware. Um, well, that's not the issue, reason to beat up on him, but his theology and the reasons for his divorce and all this and that are all questionable. But let's just go down a rank or two. We had a dean in one diocese, cathedral dean, who had a part-time job. Basically, he was a furniture, he was an antiques dealer running and out of the deanery. And there were some questions about where the money was going and what his time was spent. And he basically had a uh, day job as a, a uh, furniture salesman and a weekend job in the cathedral. Well, this sort of blew up and he was removed and now he's been appointed an archdeacon. Now, what does this tell you? It's an old boys network that the people in the top, I mean, are there no qualified clergy in the church in Wales to move up the ladder to be archdeacons that you have to take, frankly, a dodgy dean and make him an archdeacon. Uh, well. well, you're promoting one of the boys. We've seen that uh, frequently within the Episcopal Church, the Canadian Church, and certainly uh, churches within the UK. I don't know. Not surprising to see that happen. We're just disappointed to see that happen. Uh, let's move on. There's a new operations manager for GAFCON. Uh, Daniel Willi Willis is being replaced by the Australian Mr. Jody McNeil. Yeah, Daniel Willis uh, uh, stepping down, retiring after, I think he's been there since 2020. He basically ran the show at the Kigali Conference operations. Yeah. Uh, he is being replaced by uh, an Australian, Jody McNeil. McNeil is a par as director in the Diocese of Sydney, and he's doing it at the GAFCON job part-time until, until January when he retires from parish ministry and will be a full-time GAFCON operations manager. So we're seeing, you know, Paul Donison, who is a Canadian, who is uh, rector of a parish in uh, Dallas, and Plano, is, Plano, the, Plano. Plano is the general secretary. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing a bit of a shift in personnel and operations away from Africa and sort of back to Sydney. And because mm -hmm. the uh, now things are pretty quiet on the GAFCON front. Most of the work right now are their ongoing work of sort of like training and things of that nature. But we will have a GAFCON conference in the future. And it'll sort of coincide uh, with the new Archbishop of Canterbury and with the LLF and all these different things. So we're in a bit of a lull before it really heats up again on the international circuit. We mentioned last week, like the Ugandans had their synod and they didn't mention anything international. Well, that's not going to hold uh, forever. So no. well, now I is mean, the time to get good people in place 
uh, to prepare for the work ahead at GAFCON. We've been kind of mentioning ever since the closing of the General Convention of the Episcopal Church this year uh, that the church wars are largely over, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, in as such, where will the next GAFCON be hosted? Are they going to go back to Africa, Jerusalem, or maybe uh, America? Maybe Australia, but down under is a long plane flight. So, I don't know. And, and Plano in August, that's a hot time. That's a hot time. Yeah, it had to be a spring conference for sure. All right. So, let's move on to some more business here. Um, Liverpool is going to be an interesting one because we have a missing in action. It doesn't happen very often in the, uh, in the Anglican Church, but we have a MIA Bishop George. Yeah, I've gotten a few emails over the past few months telling us, George, George, Kevin, do a story about Bev Mason, the Bishop of Warrington. She's disappeared. And so I, well, what does disappeared mean? I mean? Well, she's not dead. She's not been kidnapped. <laughs> not uh, she's not being held by Hamas in a tunnel in Gaza. Nobody Jimmy Hoff at her, no. <laughs> yeah. But she, Bev Mason is a pleasantly bland, liberal woman bishop, you know, not really distinguishable from any of the other women bishops in the Church of England. She's not particularly awful. She's not particularly wonderful. She is like most bishops. She's just there. Uh, She has the Diocese of Liverpool saying that she's been on an open-ended study leave, a sabbatical, and she's been gone for six months. When's she coming back? Well, it's open-ended. We don't know. Well, isn't that nice? You get, uh, I mean, I, and, but she hasn't been there seven years to get a sabbatical, you know, for time off. I so want an here? open-ended vacation, George. That would be so cool. With pay. With, with, pay. with pay. Well, what's going on here? Well, this story really isn't about Bev Mason. It's about the mismanagement and incompetence of Justin Welby and the paralysis within the House of Bishops. The story that cannot be confirmed because everybody denies it. So this is all gossip. Totally false, George, you're being mean and cruel, repeating unsubstantiated stuff denied by the church. Well, what is this stuff that I'm saying? Mason and the bishop, John Perambuleth, don't like each other. Well, they're both liberals, George. Well, Perambuleth is a new bishop of Liverpool. He's been there since 2023. And he and Mason allegedly fell out over LLF. Perambuleth brings with him into the post of Bishop of Liverpool what I would call the Indian bishop mindset, which is he's a Maharaja. Nobody disagrees with him. You do what he says. Mason has been advocating a sort of squishier LLF, meaning let's find a way to make the evangelicals happy and not push people out of the Church of England. Why can't we just all get along? Perambuleth will have none of that. LLF is the way to go. And if you don't like it, lump it and leave. Well, this evidently came to a point where Perambuleth basically said to Mason, you're fired, but you'll get paid. Go away. So, you know, this follows the Appointments Commission unable to get bishops. I think it's Carlisle and Ely. Now, officially, we'll never know because you're not supposed to talk about what happened within the meeting, but the gossip is that it was over LLF and conservatives and liberals not being able to agree. Uh, This is about recent stories with uh, Libby Lane, the Bishop of Derby, who has a very poor reputation uh, of, well, she has a poor reputation on many levels. She's the one who messed up the Bernard Randall affair, blackballing and ruining the life and career of an Orthodox faithful priest. She's the one that has allowed her net zero people to basically tell congregations, use blankets. If your if your boiler breaks, we're not going to help. We're not going to let you replace your gas boiler. This is mismanagement and failure from the top down. I think the Church of England, like George Conger, needed to ha- needs a reflash of their uh, of their operating system. Need, need a little OS upgrade there, hey? Um, yes. But, I mean, I think it's beyond fixing at this point. You know, we reported, even since the days that we had a a certain bishop from uh, the UK on here, uh, Gavin, uh, uh, speaking about the the complete failure of the Church of England as a whole, and that it can't be fixed. 
you know it's a, it's a church of heresy up and down in and out and they've appointed such bad managers that there's just no way to fix it anymore and this is a great example well yes i agree with you but i w my hope is that a reflashing the systems operation <laughs> will do something in the united states we had two seminaries in beautiful prime real estate locations Generally, places yeah. where people would want to study and live mm -hmm. Episcopal divinity school right in the middle of harvard university beautiful buildings all paid for and general theological seminary in manhattan just wonderful place you know boston and manhattan are fun places for young people to live and study both of those schools have died. Uh, EDS is sold, uh, is gone completely. Yeah. Um, it only has a paper shell and a part time, you know, whatever, it's gone. And General Theological Seminary had to sell out to the Virginia Theological Seminary. Trinity Wall Street basically had to buy out uh, Episcopal Divinity School of the Pacific, the one in Berkeley, California. Again, a wonderful place to study and live. Average Pennsylvania is a dump. I'm sorry. I'm, I, I hope the <laughs> members of the Chamber of Commerce don't complain, but Ambridge is a dump. Okay. And it's, it's, it's coming around, but yeah, it's still dumpish. And the only highlight of Ambridge is Trinity Seminary. What if the spirit, the enthusiasm, the power, the life that you find in Average Pennsylvania had been planted? in the buildings of Episcopal Divinity School or at General Theological Seminary or Pacific, you know, the, the Church Divinity School of the Pacific would, you know, these institutions don't need to die. And, you know, Trinity Seminary is an example of one that is thriving, thriving, even in a former A&P, which is a grocery store uh, in Ambridge, Pennsylvania. Yeah. I mean, that is the interesting thing. We spoke early about this. the seminarians who come out uh, of seminary, get a uh, church job, and find out, oh my gosh, not everybody in the vestry is Christian. Here you're going to seminaries like uh, um, General Theological and others where you, you show, you, your professor's not a Christian. He's just teaching you the, the basics of New Testament or Old Testament. That they, There's no believers. If you go to uh, Trinity Anglican Seminary, you're full of believers there. The professors, the staff, um, it's a complete culture of the kingdom in a, a very good learning uh, environment. Somehow we've lost that in the Episcopal realm of great seminaries, George. We've also lost the, uh, the purpose of seminaries. In other words, once upon a time when most churches when many churches would hire seminarians as curates and the pre and the rector would train the curate that's not true anymore they're very few they're not as the scarce on the ground of churches that can afford afford to hire an assistant or a curate and train them up so a lot of these guys are having to go straight out of seminary into their first position and that you know it's like calvin up in grand rapids he's going to have a baptism by fire now he may succeed he'd do wonderfully but what you learn in seminary has really nothing to do with the uh, management. There's no business courses, the, the Bible courses. It, when, I was at, when I was at Berkeley Divinity School, you only had to take introductory Old Testament and New Testament. That was it, two Bible classes in three years to graduate. How can you be a preacher or a priest without an in-depth knowledge of scripture? Well, you know, you don't have to. If you wanted to spend your time taking courses on womanist, feminist theology for three years, you could. Well, and that's going to do you no darn good anywhere but a half a dozen kooky liberal churches that, you know, spout this stuff. Well, hold on, but it, there's, there was obviously more than half a dozen kooky churches uh, in, in order to uh, take on the crowd that came out of. I mean, VTS has still got a meaningful student body but the rest, as far as I can tell, are dead. But in the last 10 years, they sent their students somewhere. They just didn't hop the, the, the line and become bishops. Well, 
it's a difficult situation because the new generation of priests coming up that I have seen, many of them have been trained in the ther- in pastoral therapeutics. Yes. In other words, how to be a therapist, whereas that's not really the priest's job. The priest's job is to preach the gospel, to celebrate the sacraments, and to share and counsel people, not through uh, psychology, but through the word of God. And that is not being done. It's not because they don't know what it means. In Christianity, we don't look to therapy to, uh, to placate the victim. In Christianity, we let the victim know, hey, you're not a victim in Christ. There's the well, difference. Now, the one of the th- now, I was fortunate because I went to a seminary where I could, if I wanted to, got taken every course and filled up my three years with, you know, kooky stuff, useless stuff. But instead, I focused on scripture and church history and theology. In other words, when I went to a when I you know big seminary, not all my teachers were Episcopalian. Uh, the man I, I the the teacher under whom I studied systematic theology for a year and a half was Cardinal Avery Dulles, the Roman Catholic theologian. He would take the train up from uh, Fordham University and teach theology. Uh, I was able to sit at his feet and study. In other words, I could, because I chose to, have a difficult, rigorous preparation for the work that I was to do. And even then, it took me a few years to figure out how to do it right. But at least I had the tools for my training. And I still have many of the books in back of me. Next topic, the USPG, not the golf organization, reports on the reparations over slavery project in Barbados. They have $7 million to spend over 15 years, George. Well, let's talk yeah, about the this. U- USPG, uh, which is separate from the 100 million pounds that the Church of England Church Commissioners have promised. And I want to distinguish between the two things. The USPG is spending its own money, and they're perfectly free to do that, and I have no problem with that. They could call it reparations, whatever they want, but they have a discreet, definite progress. They're going to spend $7 million over 15 years, and they're doing it in these different projects and this different work. The first project they're doing this year, I'm going to read that. Conduct research to locate the burial and habitation places of enslaved persons buried on the USPG's Codrington Estate. Codrington Estate was a plantation in Barbados that provided a lot of money for the startup of the USPG. And so they're going into the history and and then the next phase will, you know, look at uh, fa- establishing family history resources. But the point is they're doing specific research, specific education and specific development goals for the ancestors of the slaves, for the descendants of the slaves on that estate. But they're also having points of measurable outcome which means if this is not doing what we think it's going to do, we're going to stop. Good. So, so good for the USPG. If they want to spend their money that way, I'm, we're, you know, we're putting in a sign, Kevin. Uh, we're trying to fix the sign here. And, you know, somebody would say, George, a sign, that doesn't bring the gospel to anybody. It just makes you guys compete with the Baptists down the road. <laughs> well, maybe. But it's our money, and that's how we want to spend it. The difference with the Church of England's church commissioner's 100 million and Justin Welby is Justin Welby recently went to Jamaica and the way he talks is we're going to give you 100 million for you guys to spend as you want as reparations where in essence we're going to solve our conscience by handing you money and what's going to happen well in the West Indies corruption is the norm so you hand 100 million dollars and a few lawyers bankers accountants who are Jamaican or whatever ancestry We'll manage this, and will any of it trickle down? No, it'll make no meaningful difference in the lives of the people of the West Indies, but it'll make a few people have bigger boats and bigger cars and pay for education in the U.S. for their kids. Is there a place in the world that we have an example of where money just didn't work, no matter how much money we put into it as a country? I remember a a Haitian earthquake. And I remember uh, Bush and uh, uh, Clinton going around in airplanes trying to collect a billion dollars for Haiti. 
and uh, Clinton got rich off it and Hillary got rich off it and Bush continued to paint paintings off it but in the reality all that money they put into Haiti did not at all lift anybody out of poverty and it just it, it was just as corrupt as it could get and that's what that's happens Haiti actually you, got worse yeah I mean that's what happens yeah Haiti still has no government that's what happens when you want money to be the solution when you want Christ to be the solution different things happen if you want uh, Christ to be the reparation ooh, whoa but no money is the reparation here George what happened in Haiti and Haiti is a failed state which will not its future is I, I don't know what the future is going to be part of the problem of Haiti was that the United States basically said if you're an educated Haitian come mm -hmm. and so the entire middle class you know, you know, doctors nurses accountants the entire professional people of Haiti who kept you know who wanted clean streets who wanted policing who wanted to make their little country their city their town whatever habitable you know the, the hotel owner the the shopkeeper those people left first and now the latest batch of people the basically you're getting the people with no skills no education no uh people well, who no, will, I, do not who are not an asset to their own country they're now coming into the united states and are being a burden in places like springfield ohio where they don't know it's wrong not to don't kill the ducks in the park and eat them don't kill people's cats and eat them um now people say oh that's that's uh right-wing propaganda well you know those the arrests ducks. of the videos <laughs> yeah, I know. But, you know the videos yeah. <laughs> of the woman arrested for cooking a duck a on cat road. and roasting yeah. it yeah but but there's the reality the people left in Haiti in the last 12 years 15 years are the ones that were raised by the gangs that were raised in the thuggery of uh, gang warfare there's you know there's barely a leadership at any government le level I don't know if they ever fixed the uh, uh, presidential palace over there but you know the, in this reality the, the only people left to send from Haiti here and Haiti is a horrible place they shouldn't have to stay in Haiti uh, one place that we should be taking people from in a very organized fashion is Haiti but um, we're not doing that in an organized fashion for certain but the Episcopal I don't know, George. Church in Haiti the Episcopal Church in Haiti is a basket case huh? um, there was a I've, we've had stories on Anglican Inc where uh, the church, uh, the diocesan, diocesan treasure administrator was arrested for yeah, arms arm smuggling. Arms. You know, they would, the, the gangs would buy automatic weapons and stuff and ship it in containers consigned to the Episcopal Diocese of Haiti. And one day a customs official just decided to look in and found small arms for the church. Um, the Episcop the election of a new bishop was thrown out by the House of Bishops because of bribery and corruption charges against the candidates. Uh, many Epis Haitian clergy have left, moved to Florida and to New York uh, for the dis diaspora congregations because they're actual own people, the people in their churches, the sort of people who became Episcopalians in Haiti have already left. And so they've mm -hmm. moved along with their people. So it, it's the people left are not the best and brightest. Now, well, there's also a warning from the State Department. Do not go to Haiti. You will be kidnapped. You are you are valuable to the Haitian people as a person they can kidnap and get ransom for. If and, my, um, a few years ago, some of you may remember my daughter Claudia spent some time teaching in the, the Dominican Republic. Dominican Republic's on the eastern side of the island of Hispaniola. Dominican Republic has like a 12 foot high wall with watchtowers and guards towers that runs the entire length of the country between Haiti and the Dominican Republic so that the Haitians don't come into the Dominican Republic. And if you look at satellite photos, Haiti is complete, almost completely deforested. Mm -hmm. um, all the trees are gone. Uh, the, the, the land has been ruined by because of with the, no trees. The water rush washes down the, you know, it's just a basket case. Well, if you look, if you see Brown and Dominican Republic, it's still forested. It's still, you know, pristine. Um, 
so, and the Dominicans police that wall, and it's easier to get to the U.S. than it is to get to the Dominican Republic from Haiti. Yeah, I and I wish I, I do wish money were the solution to Haiti. It's not. That's been proven. Well, how much money yeah. did we spend in Iraq and Afghanistan, and what did it buy us? Okay. Well, here, here's an example. After the Haitian earthquake, we spent one billion on the the, the Isle of Haiti. One billion dollars for. Uh, all the donations that they could raise. A lot of money for a little Haitian uh, thing. In Afghanistan, when we were occupying it, we were spending $2 billion, twice Haiti, over a 15-year period, a day to occupy Afghanistan. What do we have to show for it? Well, because there's corruption in the army and corruption in Afghanistan, and we don't know how to occupy a country very well, um, we lost $250 billion dollars over all those years we were there, twenty years. I guess we yeah. we we're not good at 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 sharing democracy, so to speak, making well, democratic my political my, my political take is, you know, that there are some people in the United States who profit from this. Yes, sir. The Washington elites, the mm -hmm. uh, as Dwight David Eisenhower said, the military-industrial complex, the people who make money off of wars, yeah, and they run the show. They do. No, no question about that. There's money. And, you know, right now we're in America here, just as a quick put politics, we're having an election in November. Up until then, uh, sometime in October, we pass a budget. And uh, every couple of years, we have the theater between the Republicans and the Democrats. There's no innocent party here about what's going to be in the budget. And do we have to pass a uh, a mini budget to get us to the to the point where we have a uh, pass the the overall budget? And all you're going to see the next two or three weeks on TV is the politicking in the theater of passing a budget, and it's a mess. You know why? Because all they have is the money, and they get where are we going to put it? We're going to build roads. We're going to fund hospitals. We're going to uh, empower the 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 poor. We're going to feed the hungry. We're going to um, make sure that uh, Ukraine doesn't fall to Russia. Yeah, with all this money, uh, some of it actual tax money, much of it made in 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 the mint under the Federal Reserve. Um, they, they, they're just happy we get to spend it, and then all the deals we made. In October, you'll find out what all the Republicans were able to get out of the deal and all the Democrats were going to deal. Some state in Iowa, uh, the state of Iowa will have some bridge to nowhere. Uh, there'll be a weird airport made in, in Utah somewhere, uh, all funded by the government because they had to make the deal to get this passed. Corruption is not unique to Haiti, George. No, it's unique, and, to, it's unique to money and power. And and at this point, I think the latest is that the interest on the debt is now greater than our defense budget. Yeah, it's, we're, we're paying three billion dollars a day on interest. Now we have a populace of three hundred million, million people, so it can't be that bad. But we have a populace of a hundred and ten million taxpayers. So you, you want to start d delving that money up, uh, it, it goes real quick. But we're not here to talk about money, George. We're here to move on to talk. Oh, no. <laughs> the Sandinistas. How do they get our story? Next story. Sandinistas dissolve the Diocese of Nicaragua. One of 92 church groups and 77 civilian societies dissolved. Just like that. Yeah, Nicaragua is under a uh, communist dictator, Daniel Ortega. His wife is vice president, and they run the show there. Oh, and and uh, the Sandinistas are uh, allies with Maduro or Venezuela and with the communist government of uh, Cuba. Yeah. Over the past year or two, they have been persecuting the Catholic Church, arresting bishops and clergy, and they've been expelling them from the country. And now it's the Protestants' turn. And 60, what, 92 church groups, including the Episcopal Diocese of Nicaragua, were formally dissolved. And an example, the First Baptist Church of Managua, built in 1917, which has a hospital, a school, a radio station, plus the Baptist Church, it's been dissolved. The Episcopal Diocese of Nicaragua, which is primarily, has a church, a church in Managua, the capital, but is primarily on the East Coast among the uh, what we call the Afro-Caribbean population. 
uh, in the 19th century, uh, that part of Nicaragua was controlled by the British and they brought slaves over from, from Jamaica and they intermarried with the Mosquito Indians. And that uh, was a, in the Church of England, USPG did mission work there. And there are about 10,000 Anglicans Episcopalians in Eastern uh, Nicaragua. Their 10 churches, their whole thing have now been dissolved and the assets well, and the civil societies, like the Society of Nicaraguan Engineers, the Society of, you know, all these things. Anything that is not of the state is being swallowed by the state and dissolved. Any independent religious or civil entity that is not directly created and controlled and run by the Sandinista government is being slowly shut down and absorbed. So, and the state newspaper announced that the assets will go to the state. So that means the bank accounts will be emptied and the buildings will probably lie vacant because, you know, that, or they may rent them back They'll to unofficial back organizations. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but, that's, that's the definition of communism. Everything's owned by the state. Yeah. We've, you know, we've got Christian persecution we speak about frequently in uh, Sudan, Nigeria, Congo, people murdered, people killed, but there's also this sort of persecution, which is the state persecution that extremely, most extreme in North Korea, but during the Soviet era in Eastern Europe, this is this sort of persecution, but it's being stepped up a bit. Um, and Nicaragua is gone full out communist, atheist, trying to destroy organized religion as okay. an independent force of the state. What uh, a great independent entity from the state. What a great transition to our next story, George. You, you set up a great transition. Church of England is going to have to choose a new leader someday soon, and speculation is starting to 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 well up a little bit. Who's going to be the next Archbishop of Canterbury? And this is where our viewers need to go to the comment section. Tell us who you want to be the next Archbishop of Canterbury, but also include. Who will likely be the next Archbishop of Canterbury in your comments, please? Uh, George, who are they speculating? Well, the New Statesman, which is a weekly left-leaning magazine, uh -huh. has started this game by touting three names. Guli Francis de Cani. She is a woman. She's the Bishop of Southwark, South Fork. I'm sorry, not Ch She's the Bishop of Chelmsford. Yes, me, that's, that's right. right. Chelmsford. Her father was the Bishop of of Iran. Her mother was English and she has been in the UK since the uh, Shaw was Shaw, around. Yeah. She's in her late 50s. Grand Usher, yeah, I think he's 53. He's more of an Anglo-Catholic liturgically. He's Bishop of Norwich. And the third person they're mentioning is Martin Snow, who's a more evangelical character. He's Bishop of Leicester. Now, looking at those three, all of them are on the establishment side as regards LLF and whatnot. And in fact, Martin Snow has been the man tasked by the House of Bishops to guide LLF through the House of Bishops. And it may, may very well be that in exchange for selling his soul, he'll get the top job. He's doing the hard work of trying to pull everybody together to get the job. And if he succeeds, he's the front runner. If he fails, he's out. Graham Usher is a liberal, an old fashioned liberal. He's the youngest of the candidates, so he'd have a, oh, you know, 18 year run if he's elected. And Guli Francis Takani, if the Labour government wants to make a point of having a woman bishop, this is the choice. Uh, the, uh, the Bishop of London, she's a little too old for the job, thank goodness. What? Uh, no! Yeah, she's a newsmaker, George. We need newsmakers for Anglican Unscripted. Well, she's not a newsmaker like Catherine Jefford Shari. That's nobody different. ever That's said different. she was dumb. dumb okay, no. she was bright. She was articulate. She just had some loony views. I'm not yeah. going to repeat that about the Bishop of London. Uh, yeah, she's uh, yeah, a bit of a, a bit yeah, of a. Yeah. Well, she is what she is. She is what but she is. People will say, "Oh well, Calvin Robinson should be." No, no, you got to be a bishop first. Got to be a bishop and first, and then some. 
And some say, well, they might pick someone from outside of the Church of England, what they did with Rowan Williams. He was Archbishop in Wales, and they brought yeah, him over to yeah. England. Yeah. Well, what about the Archbishop of South Africa, Tabo Makoba? Well, Tabo's one of these people who look great on paper, but is an absolute fiasco. Well, He's uh, Justin Welby. <laughs> Come on, George. Justin <laughs> <laughs> you know, so there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of uh, PC names if they want somebody to give a, uh, a an ethnic face outside mm -hmm. the UK and that they could bring in who's already an archbishop or somebody of high stature. But I, I, I think the way, Kevin, we, we, when the betting started, um, they were all the yeah, last time around, people were touting this person, and that person. And we basically said, look, the way our, we read the system, we thought that it was going to be Justin Welby. And we were right. Yeah. And Welby had only been a bishop for about a year at that point. But just, it seemed to me that the government and the the, the, the culture and, the, and the, the feel of the Church of England at that moment was a Welby. They wanted a manager to manage themselves out of this problem. But they also thought by having somebody with an alpha background, that they could fool the evangelicals into accepting him. And this is your guy because this guy wants unity above all else. And no matter what the problems we have as a church and that we've experienced over the last um, you know, 12 years and the indaba and the, and the supposed breakup of the church, Welby will solve that because as one year as a bishop, he has that proven record, George. Proven record. Now, what does the feel? Now, we're several years off to two maybe three years off two years from this coming up i think they're looking for somebody who will be sweet and bland and kind so that really does push Gouli francis to connie ahead she's not objectionable she's somebody who can be motherly because the the and who can be kind to both sides somebody who can help repair the deep damage welby has done not theological damage, but the emotional damage. Graham Usher would, he, he's not a nasty fellow, but he would basically take LLF to his logical extreme. And Martin Snow, um, if he succeeds in, you know, threading the needle of LLF, he would, he would, you know, because that's gonna require pastoral skills as well as theological and political skills. Now there are other names out there, and there's, you know, well, how the system what, works. The New Statesman lays out in great detail how the process works. It begins with a uh, appointments committee. Uh, and, well, you read this statement, you know, I'm not saying anything anybody doesn't know. It has know nothing to do with the Holy Spirit, you know, or the, lay, the clergy lady. But you and I had this discussion 10 years ago uh, before the appointment of Justin Welby. And in that, Kevin... He would say, Kevin, you have to understand one of the things built into this is one decade they'll have a traditional a, a Catholic guy like Rowan Williams. The next uh, decade they'll have an evangelical and they trade off. Uh, you can see and this at, for like the last 20 or 30 years. They said, oh, well, well, how does that work now, George? Well, that if we follow, I think it started, you know, even before George well, uh, George Carey, Carey, you know, yeah. went from liberal Catholic to Carey, the evangelical, to Rowan Williams, liberal Catholic, uh -huh. to Welby, the evangelical. If they go back, it'd be Martin, it'd be Graham Usher, yeah. the, the Catholic. Because uh, Martin Snow is an evangelical. He's on the Welby team, at least in that sense. They're all on the Welby team, They're all but the team. from churchmanship. So, uh, so if we play, so he, so the the three fit, and I think the new statesman did a pretty good job of coming up with the names. Um, the the motherly woman figure who would sort of satisfy the same the same need in the Episcopal Church to elect Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, because she's also of ethnic origin, that would sort of satisfy the Catherine Jeffrey Shorey and Michael Curry. Uh, yeah. You know, you sure. get it all done in one person. Yeah. The switch back and forth of a liberal uh, evangelical Graham Usher and the one who can show he can succeed who's an evangelical Martin Snow. Uh, so I, I'd be interested for those on the ground in England uh, to tell us who they think might be uh, appropriate. I think Cottrell's too old. I think uh, but he would be the, you know, Cottrell would be the choice. Yeah. Yeah. He, he can, you know, 
So we'll see how it comes. We'll see how it grows. Now, they can choose outside of England? No. Yes, they can choose anywhere who's an Anglican bishop. Uh, But it has to be a bishop. So, no, they're not going to choose me. (laughs) Uh, uh, They're not going to choose Galvin Robinson or... uh, But you just said anywhere. They can't choose a Gavin Ashington. No, because he's now Roman Catholic. He's Roman uh, Catholic. Okay, so. that, right. It has to be an Anglican in communion, Got which it. sort of, which you know, they theoretically they could choose someone from the ACNA. Yeah, yeah, because they're in personal communion with the Archbishop of Canterbury, even though yeah. they're not members of the Anglican Conservative Council. Who knows? Uh, fully, uh, I just got time on his hands. <laughs> well, no, I don't, don't think that's going to happen. I don't. No, I no. don't. The ACNA has got its. Well, here, here's the thing. Who, this is the, as they call it, the poison chalice. Whoever gets this job, it's it, if Graham Usher is going to have it for 12, 15 years, it's going to be a tough road because the international scene is absolutely destroyed and poisoned. Uh, Welby has been the kiss of death. And the Church of England is going through these vicious wars and... It's, we're going to see that you know, recently they announced the gov- Labour government's going to get rid of the hereditary peers from the House of Lords. That's a big and, story. Yep, yeah, and that just leaves the, the bishops of the Church of England. And so it'll just be the bishop of the Church of England and party hacks. And the next step will be getting rid of the bishops because, you know, it's really hard to defend their place in the House of Lords. Uh, but at the end, same again, they the bishops voted ninety eight percent of time, percent yeah. percent of time in uh, along the along with the labor party. So maybe yeah. those are solid votes they can have. But if uh, so, I mean the bishops will be out of the House of Lords pretty soon, and uh, so the, the answer is this is the system may have thrown up these three names, but who is the Holy Spirit? Uh, preparing and will the Church of England listen to the Holy Spirit I have good news for people if you don't know this if you didn't attend church on Sunday uh, here in America summer's over Uh, all the families and children are back at church Uh, Jill and I went to church uh, on Sunday 10 o'clock service loaded packed you know and, and you know there's a there's a family in in our church that has like a thousand kids. They took the whole pew. Uh, yeah, church is back. Summer's over, George. So, um, gets, that's good news. Also, not, not not in yeah. Florida. Oh, not right. in Florida. The snowbirds haven't come back yet. Oh no, we're not. We back have, yet. Yeah. We have to wait till after uh, after Halloween. Really, that's right. Yeah, we're going to be down there probably right before Thanksgiving. Uh, so yeah. Sorry, late this year. But uh, church is back here in America. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 879 of Anglican Unscripted.